Hi there, my name is Ben Martins and I'm one of the application specialists here at Pico Technology in the UK. And today we are going to be looking at a guest case study. So we're going to go from fault to fix. Now our case studies are on the website. So if you head to www.picoauto.com and then head to our um, sort of learning section, you'll find all of our case studies there. And we'll add a link in underneath actually in the comments down here so you can find it a bit easier. Um, right, so let's get into this case study. Now this was sent in from a customer, um, a, a good guy out in Australia actually, on the other side of the world, so Tony Knott, shout out to yourself and thanks for sending this one in. Um, so what we're going to go through is uh, this particular problem on a Gleaner harvester. So it's a combine harvester. Um, Gleaner are part of obviously a slightly bigger corporation, but obviously they get moved different machines all around the world and some will have different names of course. Classic one being Vauxhall and Opal, right? So similar sort of thing. On this particular machine, um, the customer is reporting that there was warning lights inside the cab and an unknown diagnostic trouble code. Um, when I say unknown, the likelihood is the serial scan tool would come up with a code. In this situation, it, this would be a U code, I'm giving the game away here slightly, um, but it might not have any further information about what that code actually means. So that's what we say about an unknown. As always, add diagnostic methods. So your diagnostic process, you know, there's certain things that you want to do in a certain order to ensure that you follow the process to make it as easy, as simple as possible. First thing, speak to the customer. They do have all the answers, I can assure you. Um, we want to verify the fault. So make sure that you're diagnosing a fault that's actually the, what the customer's talking about. Yeah. And then finally confirm the rectification. Make sure you get that data to prove that you've changed something. Justify the work, collect the evidence. On speaking to the customer, the local dealer for this harvester had been out several times and been unable to resolve the issue. Now, following on from that, some parts had been ordered. They'd not been fitted at this point, but they had been ordered. And those included an engine ECU, a wiring harness, and an EGR controller. None of that sounds particularly cheap. Yeah, so in this situation, our customer, our Pico customer, he was asked to take a look at it, almost to give like a second opinion. Um, and he obviously said, yeah, absolutely, not a problem. Let's have a look. So next step, what do we need? We obviously need some technical information. Yeah, we want to know what the machine is, what engine it has in it, the wiring diagrams associated, and obviously component location. Again, We've seen the other video from the um, crop sprayer and anything agricultural or off highway components can be in different places. It's good to know where they are, which will then obviously help speed up your action plan because we want to be testing and measuring based on ease of accessibility. If you want to test the EGR valve, yeah, it's sat behind the turbo, then actually you'd probably start with the turbo. Yeah, silly things like that. So the first thing that our customer did here was he was running out of time. So he's actually gone in quickly just with um, a can logger just to pull some data out of the ECU or out of the CAN network. We've got an unknown code. It is a U code. Um, so we assume now that it's something to do with communication. Yeah. So very, very quickly jump onto the network, see what information you can extract from the, uh, from the network itself. Now this situation, um, the network is J1939, and if you've seen any of the work that we've done with J1939, you should all know it's pretty standardized and really useful. Um, there's a lot of information out there about it, but it also means that we can do some extra stuff as well. So the first thing we were gonna do is actually, from his CAN log, actually find out if there's any active data trouble codes, yeah, or diagnostic trouble codes. That has its own parameter group number. And when you searched through the table, you can quickly see that there are a, you know, that DTC that or that, that um, PGN for active trouble code is always repeating. And if we look a little bit closer at that actual value, so we've got 18 FECE or CA, sorry, 00, zero then again, if we follow any of their J1939 work, we know that the last two bytes, that 00, zero indicates our source address. If it's 00, zero, it is the engine ECU. So the engine ECU is reporting an active trouble code. Now, if you have the J1939 DA document, 
and um, there is information in there about actually how to extract the DTC from the data in that message. Uh, I could go into it now, we certainly don't have the time. Um, but you can actually extract what we call the suspect parameter number, which in turn relates to the DTC. Also in there is something called the failure mode indicator, but again, it, you actually have to look at this in binary in order to actually extract that data. Yeah, Obviously, a scan tool here would make your life a lot easier. What we found though was that SPN that came out was actually cross-checked between um, another manufacturer that uses the same engine. So we know that the engine ECU is the one reporting the fault. Then obviously we can look around and see if we have similar values with other manufacturers that use the same engine. And it came up with the CAN2 circuit. Now CAN2 is a very simple engine control um, little network and it comprises of just seven ECUs. So if I just skip back to a page, we can actually see this is the topology that we've actually um, drawn out. So we have our engine ECU, an EGR valve, mass airflow, turbocharger, an NOx, two, two NOx sensors, um, and the diesel exhaust fluid quality sensor, along with access to the diagnostic port. As with a lot of off-highway machinery, the terminating resistor quite often is in the engine ECU, but also they can be external. Yeah, so be aware of that. Sometimes they're just like a little, look like a blanking plug. If people take those out, there's actually a resistor inside, right? So keep an eye out for those. So we've got our sort of guidelines. We know what can net what we're looking at. We know that we have a communication error. So what best now to do? Obviously apply peak scope. Anything we do with networks, we do always use two very common um, mass channels, and that is A plus B, where we add CAN high and CAN low together, and A minus B, where we see the differential between CAN high and CAN low. And that differential is what the, or what the ECUs are seeing. They do all the differential elements, or that A minus B internally, so then we can actually see what they are seeing. Now what we observed, or what the customer, or Tony here observed, was that actually intermittently and sporadically, the CAN network on both CAN high and CAN low was being pulled to ground. And we can see that when we zoom in. We can see this in the bottom window where we have this moment where we've got our CAN high and CAN low being pulled to ground, yeah? Throughout that capture, what we could have done is that there's certain sections of it where you can also see that it disrupts and um, causes a problem with the actual packet structure as well, yeah, as we'd expect it to. What is interesting here, though, is that if we look carefully at the A minus B, the differential it doesn't show up. So this is why it's important to remember A plus B, because it's showing you the, or you're adding the two together, yeah? So the differentials actually, because it's affecting, the problem is affecting both can high and can low in the same way, it's automatically being canceled out, okay? So bear that in mind whenever you're doing can analysis. A plus B and A minus B, they are your friends. So what is the problem? Who are we going to start pointing the finger at? What is, or where is the issue? So. First off, we're just gonna start disconnecting some ECUs just to see if it's an individual component or an individual ECU that is potentially pulling the network down. Starting off, again, ease and accessibility. Yeah, pick the ones that are closest to you. Do the easy ones first because you can tick them off the list as you go. You've also building up the evidence to prove to your customer and justifying the time that you've spent. So the mass airflow, the turbocharger and the EGR valve were all on the engine side. Remember if we go back to our topology, yeah, EGR turbo mass airflow, then there's actually a slight, um, there's a section within the loom which connects the after treatment system to the engine harness. When we removed and disconnected that, the problem disappeared. Yeah, so actually, disconnecting the after treatment side, actually saw our issue resolved. Yeah. So now we're looking on the after treatment side for the particular problem. 
Yeah, so we can see here in this situation what Tony has done. He's actually gone on either end of the network, just on this short little network now, so between the engine ECU and that connector, and just verifying that there is no problems within that loom itself. Now, again, this comes down to a bit of product knowledge and especially market specific, yeah? So country specific regulations are very different in all parts of the world. However, in this particular case, the after treatment sensors and um, systems, they were still fitted to this machine, even though in Australia, they don't have any emission regulations that require you to have these components. So why are they still fitted? Well, probably just ease. Yeah, if they're just building and shipping engines out, just easier just to throw it all on, even if it's not actually used. So somewhere in that after treatment side of the loom, there is our problem. We also have a small issue that the diagnostic connector, and I haven't drawn this picture particularly well, you would still need access to the engine ECU. So if we did separate them, yeah, we would actually lose our connection to the engine ECU, the EGR, the turbo, and the mass airflow ECUs as well. So a fix was proposed. That was to permanently remove the after treatment system completely. Remember, it's not used, it's all removed out of the engine ECU because there are no emission regulations within the country, okay? So we could safely get rid of that, put in our 120 ohm terminating resistor. We still need to add that back in to complete the circuit. We would also have needed to add in the diagnostic line as well, so we could still plug in a diagnostic connector to get access to the engine ECU, EGR turbo and mass airflow. And vehicle was put out to work, all okay. The problem was no longer there, all right? Now we could have gone in and done some further checks. We could have you know, gone through the whole after treatment system, disconnecting all the different ECUs. It was probably a NOx sensor, who knows? Um, but this machine was being used in harvest, yeah? Combine harvesters only ever come out for six to eight weeks of the year. And when they do, they need to be working constantly for 24 hours a day. The minute one goes down, that's losing money for the farmer, yeah? They want things done as quickly as possible. In this situation, obviously the temp or the fix for us was to disconnect and remove the after treatment harness. Customer's very happy with that. Obviously, no further parts were required. The engine ECU was not changed. Um, and obviously, we have a very happy customer at the end of it. Now, hindsight being a wonderful thing, if the dealer had come out and fitted all of those components, maybe the harness would have fixed it. Maybe it wouldn't have done. Yeah, And if it hadn't have done, who's paying for those parts? So remember, test not guess. One of the little things that came up from here was the topology. Now, whenever we're dealing with networks and CAN bus analysis, the topology of the network can really help identify where things sit within a network. It also gives you an idea of what should be online. Now, what I've often done in the past is I will take a wiring diagram, I will look at my CAN network, and I will redraw it out. So much like what I did at the beginning of these slides, you know, just drawing it out gives you a slightly better visualization of that network. If you're lucky enough, some manufacturers do actually write them out for you, um, and you can just print them off, and just tick them off as you go to make sure you've checked them all. But I would highly recommend drawing out your network topology if you're dealing with CAN bus issues or CAN diagnostic issues, all right? Now in this situation, obviously the verification or rectification would have been to repair whatever the actual underlying fault was. However, sometimes, especially in the agricultural and off-highway industries, you don't have time. You've just got to get that machine back up and running to make it as efficient, to keep it working in order to keep it, um, to keep it running for longer. And that's what most people are interested in. All right, so I hope that helps. As I said, that full case study is on our website. Um, yep, yeah, and we'll see you on the next one.